Ephesians chapter 3. Find Galatians. You have almost found Ephesians. Just need to persevere a little bit longer. <clears throat> Maybe we'll tie some things together tonight on the mystery. <clears throat> um, in Ephesians 3, the theme, of course, was uh, the dispensation of the gospel and the mystery uh, of the, the mystery that has been kept secret since the foundation of the world. God had not revealed it uh, in full, uh, really, to anybody in the Old Testament times. But now that Christ has appeared in the four Gospels, and now that the Holy Spirit has been poured out upon all the believers, then um, as the apostles and prophets as they began preaching the doctrines of the New Testament received by the Holy Spirit, um, then uh, that mystery began to be made known uh, to all the people who desired to know the truth of God, to not, to, desired to know the secret of God, desired to know um, uh, how God was going to manifest His work in this world, who God's Messiah was, how God was going to save mankind, uh, really the mystery of the end of the world, and how it's all going to be fulfilled in the last day. And um, <clears throat> that is what I believe uh, entails the, the idea of the mystery. Uh, so in Ephesians chapter 3, uh, let's see here. Let's, uh, let's read, let's start reading in verse 1 and we'll move down, uh, oh, probably um, verse 12 or so, something like that. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few letters, whereby ye... When you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known. Uh, that's what we just discussed, that wasn't made known earlier. Uh, unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed, and to his holy apostles, plural, and prophets, plural, by the Spirit. And once again, uh, do not let anybody tell you that only Paul had the mystery or understood the mystery and what it was. He specifically mentions here all of the apostles and the prophets. So all of the early church, as, as the, from the day of Pentecost on, they began to, they may not have known it all at once, but they began to learn and, and have knowledge of what the mystery of God was all about. What it was that God was keeping secret in times past, now it's being revealed and it's going to be revealed to everybody. And, and let me just say this. Uh, to, to, have a, to have a doctrinal idea that says that God reveals secret things to only a select elect few while He deliberately misleads other people and steers them away from believing it, uh, I have a problem with that. If Christ came, if God so loved the whole world, that He gave His only begotten Son, if Christ died for the whole world, why would God then withhold from a majority of the world the fact that Christ did die for the world? Why would He do that? He wouldn't. The answer is He wouldn't. He would, he would, he would uh, reveal Christ and show that He died to, uh, you know, for, the, for the sins of all mankind, rose again and is in heaven. God, God found a way that that could be revealed because it says in Romans and by the by the scriptures of the prophets made known unto all the nations so it's all clearly made known by the scriptures so if somebody reads the Bible and they truly want to know what God's mystery is or what God's secret is it's right there in plain sight but some people don't find it because they won't believe that what they're reading really is the secret they won't believe that. So they'll miss it. 
Uh, <clears throat> so verse 6, that the Gentiles, here's part of it. The Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise uh, in Christ by the gospel. Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And to make all men see what is the... Now this mystery has a fellowship. The fellowship of the mystery is that all of us who know uh, the mystery that Jesus Christ is God's Son, that He was sent forth here to the earth to die for man's sins, that man can uh, claim eternal life through belief in Jesus Christ. And because of that, uh, at, and, and when God blows the last trumpet, that the dead in Christ are going to rise, we which are alive remain shall be caught up together with them. And also, not only will He reveal that, but as we'll see, He will also reveal the spirit behind false prophets, false teachers, false doctrines, false churches, and the secret of who the Antichrist is. Ooh. How many of you ever wanted to know that one? Be honest. Did you ever try to figure out what 666 meant? Sure you did. So when I, when I started counting things in the Bible, some of you already know this, I, I said, I wonder what the 666th chapter of the Bible is. I bet I'll find the name of the beast there. But I didn't. But what I found was a second witness to what Revelation 13, 18 says. Revelation 13, 18 says, Here's wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast for his number of man. His number is 603 score and 6. And when you go to Ecclesiastes 7, 666 chapter of the Bible, then you find out Solomon searching for wisdom. And he said, Lo, this have I found, saith the preacher, counting one by one to find the account. And I went, well, that's not the name, but I'll, that's cool. I'll take that. Okay. <clears throat> so anyway, but we all want to know. We all want to know. And I believe, according to scriptures, that we, that we will know at a certain time we will know. Um, where was we? Verse, um, yeah, verse 9. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be, made, might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. And so what I believe what he's saying here is that to all the devils and all the spiritual forces in the world that the mystery is hidden to, and they can't figure it out. Because I still think there are things that, God is hiding from devils. I think there are. Because if God revealed to them his entire plan for even the end times events, oh, it's sort of like this. If, if we, we can read and we can go into the future. We can look into the future through the book of Revelation and we can see the outcome of a battle called the Battle of Armageddon. And the outcome of that battle is who wins? Christ and his saints, we, we win that battle. So if the, if the devil and his, all of his evil spirits could look, Ron, into the future and see the outcome of that battle, and then they would look at their plan and say, well, that's not going to work. <laughs> plan B. <laughs> okay? And then they look again. And see the outcome of the Battle of Armageddon. Well, that one didn't work. <laughs> and try another one. They would change their plan. That, that's what we know about the crucifixion of Christ, is that it was not revealed to the principalities and the powers and the spirits that God was going to have His Son slain on a cross. Because if they would have figured that out, Paul clearly says they would not have killed the Lord of glory. If they would have known that by killing Jesus, that would have then conquered them, they would have never done it. If, if those Philistines in the house of Dagon 
would have guessed, would have seen into the future that by bringing Samson in and making a sport out of him and taking him over to the two main pillars that were holding up the whole of the ceiling of the temple of Dagon and that he pulled those pillars together and the whole house came tumbling down and all the Philistines were killed. Some 3,000 Philistines died that day. If the Philistines would have known that, they would have said, keep him out of that temple. Whatever you do, do not let him inside that temple because we know what he'll do. So here's our time machine device right here. We look into the future and we see the outcome and we say, God's going to win. And we're, we're okay with that. God don't change a thing. It's, apparently it works. And so these things are now being hid still, I believe, from these principalities and powers. Uh, let's see here. Okay, verse, uh, the manifold wisdom of God, verse 11. According to the eternal purpose, which he purposed in Christ Jesus, our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Uh, let's pray. Father, we ask your blessings tonight on your word. Father, open up our eyes and teach us some good things. Lord, help us to understand, have a little bit more understanding of your word today than we did yesterday. And Lord, just add such as we need. Father, add to our knowledge and our understanding such as Lord as gives us joy and uh, blesses us, Father, when we uh, once again realize just how powerful this book is, just how right this book is. Father, this is the very oracle of God. This is you yourself speaking to us. In the pages of this book, what an amazing, amazing oracle it is. We ask your blessings on it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, um, I want to go down here to, uh, I've got my word mystery typed up. By the way, I mentioned to you that the word mystery is only found in the New Testament. Did I not? Okay. Okay. The word mystery itself is mentioned 22 times. 22 is a number for revelation. Revelation um, means things that are revealed. The book of Revelation has 22 chapters. Uh, the book of Revelation is the 66th book, which is 22 times 3. But when we look at all forms of the word mystery, we get mystery and mysteries. So there's 22 Occurrences of mystery, five occurrences of mysteries. When we add them two together, we get 27. That's how many books there are in the New Testament. 27. So it tells you the New Testament is the revealer of the mysteries. Okay? Pretty cool. Um, I'll give you another thing that goes along with that. There are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. Okay? However... There are five letters that are written differently, and they're called the final form letters. Uh, it's like in Greek. In Greek, you have two letters that represent um, the letter S or the sound S. Let's see if I can remember. One of them is sigma. Uh, well, it may be sigma. Okay, it is sigma. The letter sigma, but the letter sigma is written two different ways. It's drawn two different ways. When it's inside of a word, it's drawn one way. When it's at the end of the word, it's drawn another way. I don't have the example up here to show you, but that's how it's done. So there's, if it's at the end of a word, the letter S or the sigma is drawn differently than if it's in the middle of a word. In Hebrew, I think it's the same thing. You have five letters that are called final forms and they're drawn differently than if they were in the middle of a word. So you have the same pattern with the Hebrew alphabet. You have 22 main letters, but you have five extra letters that are the final forms, which makes 27 as well. Okay. Anyway, I don't know what that means, but I thought it was interesting. All right. So now, um, we've looked at the mystery, the mystery, the mystery, the mystery. We've enjoyed the mystery. We've acknowledged the mystery. We've um, spoken the mystery. And now, uh, two places I want you to go to. 1 Timothy 3. Turn there. 
We're going to do some comparing. Remember this morning in Sunday school, I, um, I tried, I don't know if I succeeded well, uh, just, just some of those, some days I just don't, Mark McGuire didn't hit a home run every time he got up to bat, okay? So some days I just, I don't, I don't, I hit and miss, okay? I hit and miss. Now, in, uh, in uh, 1 Timothy 3, uh, let's, um, let's get a little context here. Okay, go to verse 9 in chapter 3, 1 Timothy 3. Holding the mystery of the faith in a, pure con in a pure conscience. That's the first time the word mystery is used in this chapter. And then he said, and let, all, and let these also first be proved. And let them, be, uh, let them use the office of deacon being found blameless. In other words, the office of a deacon. The deacons are given the responsibility as well as the pastor. To hold the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. In other words, God has made us, and I would say just the church in general. He's made all of us, men and women, who are faithful to Christ and faithful to His Word. He's made us repositories of the Word. We are the safe deposit boxes of the Bible. Um, uh, it's like what Paul said in... Um, 1 Corinthians 4, I believe it was, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. And remember when Jeremiah bought the land from his cousin, Hanamiel, that he paid 17 shekels of silver and they wrote out the copy of the deed in two books. One was sealed and one was open. And they took that which was sealed and that which was open, two copies of it. One was for a permanent record. And the other one was for an open record so it can be read by everybody, so it can be shown this is, you know, this is his land. The other one was sealed up in order to preserve it in case something happened to this one. This is the way it's done at the courthouse. I, we did a wedding here uh, last Wednesday for our two Canadian friends. And uh, they went and got, they went, I showed them where to go to the courthouse to get their marriage license. And they used to give them, they used to give out two copies. Now they only do one. But they did this printout and we fill it out and I sign it with two witnesses and that gets sent to the courthouse. The courthouse records the wedding and who did it, and what date, what time we're at and so on. It records it in their books. They take the original copy and they store it there and then they send a copy to the couple that just got married so that they can have a copy. And you can order as many copies as you want. Okay. But that main one is sealed up uh, for perpetuity, forever, I guess. Um, so that will always be there as a record. These two people got married. And so that's what Jeremiah was doing. And the Bible says that they took both copies of the book, the book, that which was sealed and that which was open. And they put them in earthen vessels. And when I, re I remember the first time I read that, I went, whoa, 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 wait a minute. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. And I mean, I shout, I got happy over that. And I thought, oh, this will be good to share with people. And uh, so anyway, that's what God has done. He's made us the holders and the keepers, the safe deposit boxes of the mystery. The devil will never, ever be able to destroy the originals. Because we got them. Right? Amen. So, um, where is it going with all? Oh, 1 Timothy. Um, let's move on down here. Verse uh, 14. These things I write unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. And by the way, just underline this in your Bible. You know, that we always say, well, this isn't the house of God. The house of God is in each one of us. That's true. However, my first service here in this room was in October of 1974. They had completed the building for the most part. There were still things they were working on. But they got it. They got it far enough to where they could start having services here. 
And the original church was over on Gamble Cemetery Road, which now is under pavement. They, they had to move because I, Highway A was new highway. They called it 21A was moving through there. And so they bought out all that land and it's all gone. So they built this building. And I remember I asked mom, what is a dedication? And she tried to explain it to me. But basically, the, the people of this church, having had built this church, said, we set this building aside for one purpose. That is for public worship, uh, for the preaching of the gospel, edification of the brethren, and so on. Okay? Um, it, it's not a bingo hall. It's not a dance club. It's not a, it's not a coffee shop. It's not anything else. And so any place in this context here, verse 15, any place where the, the brethren are gathering is basically the house of God. And I want you to notice this. He said, I want you to know how to behave in the house of God. And, uh, I think it's important. For us adults to, number one, show an example and teach the example to a younger generation how to have respect for the house of God. Uh, I was taught, you don't bring sandwiches in here to eat. You don't bring soda pop in here, suck on a soda pop. You don't bring coffee into this room. You don't do that. Uh, my mom constantly was getting on to me for playing Scott Joplin ragtime music on the piano over there, okay? I mean, she was all the time, quit playing that! And I didn't understand it, but what she was doing, she was trying to teach me the difference between sacred and profane. And that music in itself, there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, it's fun music to play, and it, and it really develops a, the technique that I have to this day. But she knew it wasn't right for the house of God, so she kept telling me, would you quit playing that in here? And um, so anyway, there was just certain th things that I learned growing up that when you come to the house of God, there's a way you ought to be and things you ought not do and things you should do. Um, I was taught to dress right when you come to the house of God. Now, I'm not a legalist when it comes to what you wear, what you don't wear. I used to be. OK, but I'm, I'm not anymore. But I would say this, I think there's a right way and a wrong way to dress, to show respect and reverence for the house. And I, let me just, let me put it this way. Even courts of law in this country, there's a way that you should dress if you go to court. You don't go to court wearing uh, some tight shirt with your stuff sticking all out the sides of it and wearing short shorts with everything sticking out the back of it, coming into court like that. A judge will throw you out and say, you come, when you get dressed, you can come back into court. Uh, guys don't come in court with their cutoffs and their Budweiser t-shirts. Okay? Belly sticking out the bottom of them. <laughs> okay? There's a way that you should appear when you go into court because you're showing respect and honor for the institutions of our nation. This is how our country is run. This is who decides what's good and what's bad. And, and people, for the most part, will dress accordingly. Lawyers know how to dress in a courtroom. They don't get by with that. So they, if, if God can require it out of a courtroom, um, or if people required it out of a courtroom, then I think it's a good standard to follow when you come into the house of God. Isn't God more important than an earthly courthouse? Of course it is. Um, and you'll notice that we put up no vaping signs around. I, I never really thought much of it, but uh, it was brought to my attention. And so I thought, you know what? It, I don't think it looks good. And so we just decided no more. And uh, because you can't you can't vape in a courthouse, you can't go to uh, you can't go to the hospital and do it. And um, there's just a lot of places you can't do it in. So don't do it here. 
uh, and just other things like that, that we learn how to behave in the house of God. And then there's more important rules. Behavior in the house of God, like um, one of the business meetings, and I know I'm chasing rabbits, but it's, it's rabbit hunting season today anyway, so for me. But I remember we had a bad church split in uh, 1978, 79, somewhere around in there. And um, here, I'm about 12 years old, and I'm watching this. And these, these are people now that I've stayed at their house. I've played with their kids. They've taught me in Sunday school class. I've just done everything with them and for them. And I see people that I love yelling and screaming at one another in a business meeting. And one lady, there was a man that I loved dearly named Dale McCurry. He's one of the best deacons I, that I personally have ever known in my whole life. Dale was a godly man. He was a humble man. He was a good man. And um, the idea was they were trying to run the pastor off. They had a secret meeting behind his back while he was gone to the National Association meeting and they had a secret meeting behind his back and they decided then that that's, they were going to get him when he came back. And sure enough, he came back and they, they started, had, they said, we're going to have a vote of confidence on you. And there was discussion. And I remember this brother Dale McCurry stood up in favor of the pastor and this woman who I had, I mean, I had stayed at her house. I played with her son. We were buddies. Uh, we went to school together. Um, I just admired these people. She got up. She didn't like something Dale said. And she slapped him in the face right in the middle of this business meeting that we're having in the church house. Now, that's behavior that does not belong in the house of God. And that killed me. That killed me. And I made up my mind years ago. If I ever became pastor here, that was not going to happen here. And uh, I've had to get between people before. Um, the pastor that was here before me, I had to get between him and another man in the church. Because they were going back and forth at each other. And I'm here I am trying to block. And, oh, quit talking to each other. And uh, I'm just like, because they started it out here. And I said, guys, this is not the place for it. And they went in the office and they went at each other. And I got them to both calm down a little bit, but it wasn't, it wasn't good after that. Nothing was good after that. And so there's behavior that should never, ever, ever take place in the house of God. Okay, that you, yeah, you ought to learn that thou mayest know how, how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. That's what the church is for. Is to be the pillar in the ground of the truth. This is a place where sinners come to see what saints are like. Remember that line I drew this morning in the sermon. We're on this side and we're supposed to show that there's love over here and there's joy and there's happiness. There's peace and contentment. There's forgiveness. There's mercy over here. Over there, it's all chaos and sin and recklessness and fightings and tumults and so on. We want to invite them over on this side. But if they see us fighting all the time and getting at each other all the time and not acting right all the time, um, acting in, in evil ways toward one another, acting in backstabbing ways toward one another, acting in, in lascivious ways toward one another, then they're not, obviously, they don't, they say, well, we can get, we can do that over here on this side. We don't need your side. So anyway, it does damage. And so verse 16 now, here it is. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. And what you might want to do is on a piece of paper, we're going to maybe make two columns like I did this morning. One is called the mystery of godliness. The other one is the mystery of iniquity. Okay? So we have the mystery of godliness mentioned in 1 Timothy 3.16. We also have in 2 Thessalonians 2, the mystery of iniquity mentioned. So I believe that they're related. Absolutely. Absolutely. One is showing you Christ. The other one is showing you, in fact, I think both of them in a way are showing you Antichrist. Antichrist is going to be the opposite 
of what Christ is. Okay? So, he says, great is, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. He appeared in a body. No? What's wrong with what I just said? Are you doubting me? You questioning me? Huh? He appeared in a body. What's wrong with that statement? Who appeared in a body? See, that's not what it says. In the modern translations, Ron, they took out God was manifest in the flesh. Because that's understandable, right? Who was manifest in the flesh? God. It's clear as a bell. The modern translations, all of them say he appeared in a body. Who did? No, we don't know. God was manifest in the flesh. And this is a key doctrine. Because John says that if you want to know where the spirit of Antichrist is, any spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is Antichrist, is not of God and is of the Antichrist. So we have to believe that God literally was manifested in human flesh. And he was. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Okay? God was made manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Now, how many things are there here? Let's count them. Six. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. Six things here. Now, why six? Everybody said, well, six is the number of, that, of, the, of man and the beast, and that's bad, isn't it? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Um, turn to Genesis 6. And what you're going to see here is the mystery of iniquity. But it's, in a way, you're going to see also that it's modeled after the mystery of godliness. And I'll try my best to explain what I mean by that. To me, it's clear, I you know, spent a lot of time studying these numbers out, wanting to know what they stood for, what they represented. And remember... Okay, let's take Goliath for instance. Goliath is six cubits tall and a span. That's a span. And we know his, one of his brothers had six fingers on each hand, six toes on each foot. We can make an assumption that all the giants had six fingers and six toes. We don't know that, but we know his brother had it. We also know that um, Goliath's spearhead was 600 Shekels of iron, I think is what it was, 600. And so Goliath has sixes pasted all over him, okay? And he also is a leopard and a bear, and that's two of the animals that were mentioned in Revelation 13 concerning the beast. Um, so Goliath is a type of Antichrist. But what do we know about giants? What we know about giants comes from Genesis 6, where they came from. Uh, verse 2, the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them wives of all which they chose. So, and then in verse 4, there were giants in the earth in those days and also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men of old, which were of old, men of renown. So, we have fathers from the spirit realm who have joined with mothers of the earth realm and they created a hybrid species. We know that. We know from scriptures that they have seed. We know that the sons of God, by way of the, all of the Old Testament references, including Psalm 82, I've said, Ye are gods and all of ye children of the Most High. So children of the Most High is a son of God. And they are God's little g. And so these sons of God took human women, went in unto them, and created, uh, you, could, you could say, 
a God race on the earth, a race of kings, a race of heroes, a race of mighty men, a race of, uh, there undoubtedly, undoubtedly these men were far advanced in their knowledge. Undoubtedly. They were, I would say, undoubtedly, these, these giants were probably a very adept at magic, sorcery, witchcraft. We know that they practice it because that's what God said when he, when he said, when you go into Canaan land, destroy all their things. Don't learn them. Don't read their books. And God gave a list of nine things that he told the Israelites not to do. Necromancy, sorcery, wizardry, uh, witchcraft, things like that. Don't learn that from them because that's what they do there. So I believe that they were very, very adept at sorcery and witchcraft. I believe that they had advanced knowledge of the motions of the heavenly luminaries, the sun, the moon, the stars, because of all of the ancient buildings that are lined up with the stars, with the summer solstice, winter solstice, lined up with uh, the star Sirius and so on. The, the pyramids uh, are lined up perfectly, perfectly with the three stars of the belt of Orion. And I mean perfectly aligned up there. And so how could, how could men back then have this kind of knowledge? Well, they didn't. I believe the giants had this knowledge. And so they were hybrids. They were half gods and half human. All of that was to be a mockery of, turn to Matthew 1, and I won't read that whole chapter, but we'll look at the number given to us in Matthew 1. The lineage of Christ is given. And so we say of the giants, they were half God and half human. We say of Christ, he was fully God and fully human. Amen. So when we look at verse 17 of Matthew 1, so all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. And from David until the carrying away into Babylon are 14 generations. Add those two up. 14 and 14 are 28. And from the carrying away into Babylon unto Christ are 14 generations. Add 14 more, which is 42. And 42 is 6 times 7. 6 because he's fully man. 7 because he's fully God. So the number 6 seems to indicate the hybrids. They are a hybrid um, a hybrid race. Okay? They are the mixture. So in back in, in what was it? First Timothy three sixteen, six things that mark who Jesus was, and the first thing it says was God was manifest in the flesh. And that seems to match what you see in Genesis six, the devil's version of making a Messiah included the gods mingling their DNA with the seed of men, making these little messiahs. That's who I think Matthew 24 talks about, for there shall be many Christs. Many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. Well, is it possible then that these who come saying, I am Christ, literally are hybrid men, part angel, part human, giving them special powers, giving them advanced knowledge, giving, giving them the, everybody will follow them because they can do lying signs and wonders. Okay? So I think this world is in for such a deception they won't get they won't be able to get past it. Now go to uh back to Second Thessalonians two. So we have the mystery of godliness and its opposite, the mystery of iniquity, which is the Antichrist. Let's read some of the context here. Second Thessalonians two verse three Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. Mark it down. That's what's going to happen first. 
Not a, not a uh, catching up, as Jimmy Swaggart says. Somebody sent me a Jimmy Swaggart commentary Bible. And it's got Swaggart's alterations all in the text. Not at the bottom, but right in the text. Embedded right in the text like it was God himself saying it. And Swaggart didn't, doesn't believe that the falling away comes first. So he says, well, obviously, then it doesn't say falling away because that would make me wrong. Okay? And I can't be wrong. There's too much money on the line. Okay? Uh, so he altered it in the text to say the Greek word here could be rendered as caught up or caught away not fall away caught away so now swagger's right i just that made me mad there shall come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called god or that is worship so that he is god sitteth in the temple of god Showing himself that he is God. This is now part of the mystery of iniquity. He's, he wants to claim Godhood, but he's not God. Okay? And those who believe he is God will say he is not not God. Some of you will catch that later when you wake up. Um, verse 5. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? No, Paul, because we weren't there. And now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time for the mystery of iniquity. There it is. Doth already work. Uh, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Um, and then shall that wicked, capital W, be revealed. That's like a name of him. Mr. Wicked. Be revealed. Whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. If you read Revelation 19 and you see Jesus coming down uh, from heaven with ten thousands of his saints, the Bible says he has a sharp two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. That's the spirit coming out of his mouth. That's what It's the Bible that destroys. The Bible destroys the man who doesn't want the Bible around. Imagine that. The only weapon... That can be forged against the Antichrist. And the devil has convinced more and more and more people in these days that they don't need the Bible anymore. Imagine that. Lay down your swords, everybody. We don't need them. Um, for the, uh, let's see, verse, But then shall wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders. In other words, the devil and this, this man of sin will have unlimited power to deceive mankind. So, uh, just to give you a little update on what's going on in the world of artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence, you can make a video of you speaking and you can run that through an artificial intelligence program. It'll alter your face so that it's not your face speaking those words. Okay? That's called a real fake. And what's happening is it's fooling people. So, artificial intelligence to the rescue. So now they had to have an artificial intelligence system designed to detect whether or not an artificial intelligence face is real or fake. Isn't that something? Okay. We have a machine that changes people's face. Now we have to have a machine smarter than that machine to tell whether or not... You remember the Mission Impossible series. And at the end of the series, some guy would go... And pull off his face mask. Oh, it's you! 
That's how they got them, okay? Well, that's what we're dealing with right now. Artificial intelligence working against artificial intelligence to show you that it's artificial intelligence at work. And the problem's only going to get much worse. It's not going to get better. So this is, you know, when, when people call me and they have, I mean, like this guy calling this week saying he was a sovereign citizen. That kind of set me off a little bit because I just I don't have a very high opinion of people who turn themselves over to that. I don't. Um, they've they've fallen into a line of garbage that is very, very dangerous. You could get yourself killed that way. Uh, because you're in open rebellion to police authority and you're going to get killed one of these days. Um, but anyway. Um, where was I going with that? Oh, people falling into lies in these last days. And that's something, something like that is a no-brainer. Just like the flat earth. It's not flat. Except in Kansas and Iowa. But the rest of it's not flat. Um, but anyway, people believe that. And that, is, to me, is a simple lie. But they believe it. What happens when this false prophet or this or the devil comes out with and God allows them a strong delusion? They will not be able to determine whether or not it's real or not. By the way, there's two types of artificial intelligence, weak AI and strong AI. Strong delusion. Okay. All right, mystery of iniquity, Antichrist. Mystery of godliness, Christ. Now you know the mysteries. And I think both are going to be revealed to us. One's already been revealed to us. We already know who Christ is. And I think we're going to know who the Antichrist is. I think we're going to go, that's the Antichrist, don't follow him. Kill all of them. Okay, let's stand.